Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the TechAG interview series. If you're a member of the uh, Vetrix Fans Unite Facebook group, you might recognize the name of our guest this evening, Matt Jenkins. Matt is an avid retro game collector, specifically and mainly of the Atari 5200 and the Vetrix. He is, um, is known as one of the guys who knows how to repair Vetrixes, which is you know, there's not a lot of them out there, so that's that's a that's a heck of a skill. He is a member of Hacks, which is the Hoosier Coin Op Collector Society. In the past, um, Matt has made uh, you know these um, light pens for the Vetrix and small batches, but recently he's been resurrecting a project called the Atari 5200 Redemption Device, which is actually how I met him. His family does describe him as the Vector Game Guy. So without further ado, and without reading any more stuff that I have on my sheet here, I'd like to introduce and welcome uh, Matt to our podcast tonight. Welcome, it's Matt. A, it's an honor to be with the TechG nerds. I feel like I'm in good company. <laughs> What's that line from Die Hard? Welcome to the party, pal. So I, I, I had to laugh. One of the things that you said to, you said to me is um, that your wife said, unless vec unless the word vector is in it, um, you weren't interested in it. Um, I thought that was kind of funny. Well, I was actually impressed that she was able to call up the word vector. <laughs> I was like, oh, she said, oh, yeah, that game we always play at Tappers. And I was like, oh, no, we, uh, you're thinking of Space Zap. And I was thinking, you don't know what vector is. And she goes, no, the one that's the sit down cocktail game. And I was like, oh, Tempest. OK, you do know what a vector game is. That was amazing. Uh, we have a local arcade called Tappers in Indianapolis, and they have a sit-down Tempest machine. Uh, I have to give props to my wife, because every time it's our anniversary, it is her suggestion to go stay a place downtown and go to Tappers. So we have drinks, play video games, and usually get a hotel room downtown. And that's part of our thing, is we sit at that, cocktail, that Tempest cocktail table and play a few games. So she gets Wife of the Year award for that, for sure. And we also have an Asteroids Deluxe machine in our house. And when that installed, she posted to Facebook, wife of the year. <laughs> Tolerance from your spouse is a nice thing. Man, I have a broken Tempest machine in my house. Uh, well, that counts for a lot. Yes, yeah, since it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, well, it's they're, they're their own beast to get them running. Is it in your garage or in your house? It's actually in my garage because it's broke. I'd like to bring it down here, but I need to fix it first. So yeah, they're they're a beast. I understand, but congratulations, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, well, I don't know how to fix it, so unless I can find a repairman, I don't know. It'll probably never get fixed. But yeah, those, yeah. Ve those vector games, from what I understand, have you ever worked on any of the actual arcade machines, Matt, or are you just being mainly sure. Vectrix? No, oh no. It, I think that if you are an arcade collector, you also know how to repair them. <laughs> That's part of the game, really. In fact, I've sold a few from people who don't collect, and I'm not comfortable with it. I put a, a millipede machine up on Facebook Marketplace, and there was a dude who wasn't part of the arcade collecting community. And I didn't want that to be his first machine because I didn't want him to get it home and be like, oh, well, it worked at your house, and now it's not working. C come up to Fort Wayne and fix it. No. Everyone in the arcade collecting community kind of understands that it doesn't take much and you have to be able to fix them and maintain them if you're going to have them in your house. Yeah, well, my dad used to know how to fix them. And when we brought it here, it broke, though, and we, we just couldn't get it fixed. And then he, then he kind of got old. So it doesn't well, it's, you're, it's time for you to take up the mantle and learn. Oh, boy. Well, I'm not an electrical engineer. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, you're going to be one before you're done. If you're, part of the, if you're part of the Techagy crew and you're into 3D printing and all that, I'm sure you I know are. how to, I know how to do that, and I know how to do some other stuff like Arduino and that. But the the Tempest machine, I see how hard it is to fix. That's a little beyond me. Uh huh. How is it that your father was able to repair them? Is that what he did professionally? He, he was an electrical engineer for golf research, and uh, mm -hmm. he he we worked on all kind of different computers. So he knew how to test all the chips, and you know how to burn ROMs and all that stuff and everything. So you know. So I still have his oscilloscope and everything else here, but, uh, you know, but it's some of the chips were burned out, we think, somewhere, and then maybe even the picture tube went out. We're not positive. So mm -hmm. that's what happened. The video went. So. Well, I know how to do all that stuff, but I didn't know until I started collecting arcade machines. So you'll learn. It's just nice. part of the game. <laughs> 
what's in your collection, Matt? So you have Asteroids Deluxe. Well, uh, honestly, yeah. I'm trying to pare it down because it's a, I'm I'm becoming more practical as I get older because I know there's only so many years I have left on Earth. And I see a lot of people and I I, I don't want to like poke anyone who might be on this podcast because I know you're a hardcore collector. But I used to be more of a hardcore collector. And I noticed that some of my friends who had every game in box and have, uh, you know, shelves full are kind of showing them off for their YouTube channels, but they don't often play the games. And I think sometimes we forget to do that. So now that we're friends, I will nudge you periodically to, uh, <laughs> hey, what have you played recently? And actually, I know all of you play because I've watched several of your episodes now. So I, at least you guys play and don't just simply collect because that would be kind of depressing, right? Because you then your hobby is searching eBay every night obsessively. Did, did you watch our 24-hour live stream? <laughs> No, did you have one? We did over Christmas. It was for donations to an animal shelter, but we played games. <laughs> oh, awesome. No, I haven't gotten that far back. No, 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 no. Do do not watch our 24 hour. Yeah, don't stream. watch the 24 hour. <laughs> me, me and JC are big, big time gamers. We we play every game we get our hands on. So ah, good. I'm glad to hear it. There was a the only part that's in inter- there's some interesting parts in there. We talked about a bunch of different things. We played some games, but the I think one of the best parts is when we it was the second day when I started playing the um the Bible Adventures games, um for because it was a Christmas stream, um, uh-huh. so that's when it got interesting. And then my, and then MC left, and we got in this like thing about movies, and then he came back. And so if you do watch any of it, watch like because I think we were drunk the night before, <laughs> so. <laughs> At least MM and I were, and then the next day we were sober. So, yeah, yeah, it's everything you do before that New Year's resolution. Yeah, we're getting our last uh, last uh, drinks in. So, yeah. in other words, watch the second half, not yeah, the first. Yeah, watch half. skip skip about sixteen hours. I showed in. off a lot of games during that because there, there was a whole mess that I showed off on the ColecoVision for the emulator. Oh yeah, you had the what was the Santa Claus one? That was a good one. Oh yeah, Mean Santa. That one yep. was a lot of fun. That's actually out for like Atari. I think it might be out for uh, in television. No, it's out for Odyssey. It's out for Odyssey of all the the the, the things. So, Matt, I used to have five, uh, five arcade games, and then my wife wanted her dining room back. Mm-hmm. So I'm down to two. I've got an okay. R-Type and I got That's a Donkey Kong. What else? R-Type? Uh-huh. R-Type cool. and a Donkey Kong. The only reason R-type I kept R-Type type is the monitors were interchangeable. So I could always have pieces for the Donkey Kong. I have the paint. I have everything to finish the restoration on the Donkey Kong. It has an issue. It's developed. Like you said, they they all develop something. I know it's what voltage. So I've got to go in and just adjust the voltage. But um, but I'm trying to keep it as original as I can. I've, you know, not putting an LCD in it, making sure I have the screen. You know, I've even found a place in, of all places, Moultrie, Georgia, that still does, they do new versions of the coin things and new versions of the original Nintendo joystick. So, and then my son. Oh, yeah. Arcade shop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, but they, they they do those. And then my son made me the art for the sides. He's a mechanical engineer and he was able to get to his machines and was able to do the art for me. He figured out, found the vector graphics. There's vector for you. Found the vector graphics and was able to um, to print them. For me, so I have all the art and everything. Right now, it has a Master Chief fathead on the side of it, just because it doesn't stick on the wall anywhere in my office. So, um, but um, but yeah, so it's I agree with the paring down and not people not playing them. I mean, there's collecting is collecting is like you know when you collect coins and stuff like that, you can't really play with your coins. I mean, that's one thing that I like about this hobby is you can actually pull something out of the box or you use a multi cart and play stuff as you know it was intended to be played but there's i don't know about you but there's something about taking this original mm-hmm. cartridge and sticking it inside a machine I, I feel that i'm a big fan of original hardware i know the feeling of holding the box in your hand it's it's pretty special so so the redemption let's t- let's talk about the the 50 because that's how that's how you and i actually met was was about the redemption it was a, a product that was and we actually talked about it during our flagship last night i did a little video showing how it works and everything um so you'll get to see that um which you already know how it works so it really doesn't help you other than seeing somebody else use it but um you know it was a project that happened about 20 years ago and they and they sold well and all of a sudden they quit they quit making them. Mm-hmm. i mean to me the 5200 is it has the worst controllers ever um and and this little dude right here actually i actually had fun playing on the 5200 without getting frustrated but 
tell us, you know, tell us how you, um, you know, decided to resurrect it. And well, uh, it really does redeem the this, this system. I think all your viewers know, and probably several people on your team here are 5,200 collectors, at least a couple of you guys, I know. I don't need to go over the details probably, but everyone kind of knows that the controller for the 5200 is is pretty lame. They tend to go bad just sitting sitting by themselves. Uh, the contacts inside corrode. So even if you have a working joystick mechanism, if they've been sitting too long, even a couple of years after they were brand new, you couldn't start a game because you know the only way to start most of the games is by hitting the start button. So these were something that was was desperately needed in the 5200 community. Um, it was uh, designed by a guy named Joe Grand, and it's a pretty brilliant circuit. And as I understand it, Atari Age started selling them in late 2003. So I did. I wasn't in the scene then. They discontinued it in 2009. I think it probably went when this course it sold as many as it could to as many collectors as there were but in the intervening years since 2009 i think a lot of us have picked up i wasn't a collector back then i didn't get my atari 5200 till just like five years ago no not even that more like three years ago i think so i wanted a redemption adapter so that was the impetus for it is i just wanted to build one for myself and my friends yeah, and then i realized <laughs> Yeah, well, and then I realized other people wanted them too. So I thought, really, I've gone through all the trouble of learning how to do this and sourcing the parts. That was the biggest thing is that I sort of owe it to the community to at least make some available. I mean, though it's not my intention to sell a whole lot of them, but there are clearly people out there. Not a lot, but every now and then you see a thread where someone's like, what happened to the redemption adapters? Why can't I get one? Um and when they do go on eBay, they're like $300. And that just yeah. seems ridiculous. So as DIYers and electronics nerds, we're like, no, I'm not paying. Well, that's outrageous. But they're necessary. I mean, they're not necessary. There are other options out there. But this is a really good one to have in your arsenal. And I didn't like missing out on it. So I decided to make them. So, so you mentioned that you etch your, some of your own circuit boards. Are you actually etching the, these boards oh, yourself? Oh, uh, no. These are very complicated circuit boards. Okay, right? I was wondering. No, uh, the, the the designer Joe Grand actually um, made it available under the uh, the CC. What's it called? Community Commons. What's it called? Creative Commons. Creative Commons. So really, anybody can make them. Yeah. Um, but that jumped out at me as something I wanted to do, and it. So here I am. Well, that right there kind of brings us to you know the big question of the hour, and 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 again. Um, you know, coming back to the 5200, what what made you resurrect, you know, this project from, you know, 20 years ago on Atari age now? I mean, what 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 drove you to bring the redemption back? Well, the simple answer is because I wanted one for myself. See, I missed that whole era when they were available. They were available from around late 2003 until they were discontinued in 2009. But I didn't actually pick up my first Atari 5200 until 2019, just a few years ago. So, you know, every now and then I see a thread on Facebook or Atari Age where people are like, oh, I wish I could still get a redemption adapter. And I, th I always thought, me too. Well, because uh, Joe Grand, the original designer, uh, released the, the design uh, under the Creative Commons, I thought, oh, well, that's great. That's a perfect opportunity for me to build a couple for myself and for some of my friends. And um, while I was doing it, it seemed only natural to make a few available to those other people who were like me, who wished they could get one and not pay $300 on eBay, which is ridiculous. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, I, it, you shouldn't have to pay collector's prices for something that you can build. So are you actually building your, you know, you mentioned that you're etching your own boards. Are you actually making your own boards on these or are you selling oh, no. them off? No, these are very complicated boards and they are professionally manufactured by a PCB maker. They are the exact same board that was used in the original Redemption adapter. So we know the design is is good and solid. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and there's like, you, I think you said... At one point, there was three different versions of these. Well, the the beauty of this design is one circuit board will build all three types. There was one for the PC for using a, a PC joystick on your 5200, right? 
because it's there, those were analog, just like the 5200 joysticks. There was one for um, the Sega Genesis and Atari 2600 compatible sticks. You know, anything that works with an Amiga or a Commodore 64 or one that has the D sub nine connector. And then there was one for the 7800 sticks. And each one of those could be built just by using different resistors and jumpers on the same circuit board. So it's a really ingenious board. And uh, I decided to try to build one of each just, just to try them out, just to see which one I liked the best. Um, I reached out to Albert at um, Atari Age just to, uh, uh, you know, get his advice and make sure he was okay with me doing this because this, you know, this really is an Atari Age product. I don't want to take something away from him. He's totally fine with this. And I knew he would be because I'd seen posts that he made at Atari Age and on Facebook where he's, when people would ask, hey, can I get another redemption adapter? He'd be like, maybe, but I don't really relish the idea of soldering all 15 of those. That was the big pain in the butt was prepping those wires, prepping the shells, because it is a lot of work to hand build them. Um, so the soldering part's actually the easy part. It's 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 the shell preparation and and getting the wiring all done for the, the 15 pin uh, connector. Cool. Hmm. Anybody else have a question? I seem like I'm monopolizing here. So that's because you know more about the 5200. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know, John. I, I know JM wants something for the ColecoVision at some point. I know we were talking earlier about how bad, you know, the controllers of that age, you know, they they were definitely challenging. I mean, the ColecoVision one, man, I grew up with it. I'm used to it. But you know, the Intellivision one, we we spoke a little bit about that. Um, you know, uh, off camera, you were kind of talking about, um, you know, maybe I'll make something for that. <laughs> so, well, well, there was, you know, there's been some talk over the last couple of years from the, from the ColecoVision retro community about uh, someone, you know, making one, but it, we have not seen that yet. And uh, that's, you know, something like this would be a welcome thing, um, you know, for the ColecoVision retro uh, gamers. So. That's something that I would be in favor of. I know that might not be something that that Matt might be interested in, but in case anybody else is listening, maybe they can. Right. Come it's up probably, with a, come it's up probably with a way beyond that, my yeah. skill set, but so many controllers use that same D sub nine connector. I'm envisioning this, the joystick to rule them all. Can you imagine one that worked on your ColecoVision and your Vectrex and your Atari 2600 and your Atari 7800. Yeah. I know it's possible. It could be very, very complicated, but I do lay in bed and think about those sort of things at night. <laughs> they only would have made the keypads the same. It's the keypads that makes it so complicated. Yeah. yeah. So much internal switching would have to happen to make one work for all. Ed Ladin has a really good one on the way, it looks like, that will do both. Mm, I could be wrong. I know they have one that does both ColecoVision and 7800. Am I right about that? Uh, I, I, I thought it was the... I thought they had one that was 20... I thought it was 2600 and ColecoVision. Maybe or that's... Am I wrong, Mike? I remember I have a little switch on the back for switching between ColecoVision and yeah, they have they have well, I have one that's just strictly ColecoVision, but they make um it, it's I think it's called a I think it's called a super something or super in the name super something seventy eight yeah yeah and it, but it allows for like I think if I'm if I'm not mistaken three different systems I don't know I believe I believe I I'd have to look it up but um yeah that's that's probably the closest, but that, but the 5200 is, isn't, that's different. Like the 26 and the 78 use the nine pin, right? Yeah. And, Cole and Coleco. And, and Coleco. Um, yeah. But the 52 in television did starting with the, with the, um, in television too, but the pinouts are totally different where Coleco vision, you actually could take a, a Atari controller and use it on a ColecoVision. In fact, I did because I liked one of those big red Wicco joysticks with the with the thing on it, with the um, with the the trigger on top. You guys remember those? And I used that with my ColecoVision playing Donkey Kong. Oh yeah, yeah. My cat. So you know, Atlatin makes a they make a an adapter for a seventy eight hundred, but nothing for a fifty two hundred. I'm surprised. I, I was well, surprised they have one on the way. Do they? Oh, for, they, for the fifty two. They have one announced, yes, with the keypad oh, okay. and everything. 
their website only currently only has the 7800 adapter that i'm seeing so what's the demand for the redemption 7800 for the, for the redemption that uses a 7800 controllers is there much of a demand for that or is well it... that gets back to my story when i consulted with albert he he said don't even bother with the pc version because we hardly sold any of those and I think he had a figure of how many more of the, the, the Genesis ones they sold. But because Steve's video focused on the 7800, surprisingly, about 50-50, a little, really? little less than 50%. And it, it, it boggles the mind because I thought I was going to make zero of them because I really hate that controller. I really hate it a lot. I do too. <laughs> And and I always I always see people on the Facebook group saying, oh, you know, it, people will bitch about the controller and they hate it. And then someone someone will come along and just be contrarian. I think they're just being contrarian and they'll say, but I like the 7800 version and I don't have any hand pain. And I think, and so if you've ever said that on a forum and someone has confronted you, it was probably me because every time I see that comment, I say, please tell me how you're using it. And I really want someone to tell me if they're just being contrarian or do you have some special kind of hand that I don't have? Or you have some special grip because um, imagine you're holding the kind of see how I have one. Okay, imagine you're playing Moon Patrol. I don't know if you can see this. Sure, oh, yeah. hand has to grip while one fin finger presses this to fire and this to jump while you're gripping it. After a half hour of this, your hand will hurt and you will have carpal tunnel the next day. So <laughs> I have wanted an explanation and they never respond. It kind of makes me a little bit mad. So I've always, I've never believed it. However, I didn't believe it till I watched Steve's video on Wired Up Retro. And he said, he used the phrase hand discomfort. I've never experienced that hand discomfort. And that was the first time I believed that it was true because he's, he's such a, he seems like such an honest guy. So some people don't experience that, but I do. If I play 30 minutes of any game where there's a lot of fire button action, the next day my hand will ache. So I didn't think anyone was going to buy the 7800 adapter. So I wasn't even going to make them. I was just going to make the uh, 2600 version. So I have a no. couple of them here. Now, did, did everyone see Steve's video? I did, yeah. Oh, you'll have to watch it. There's one of each. And I asked him if he wanted the 2600 version or the 7800 version he wanted the 7800 version and i was very surprised by yeah, that. very surprising uh, but i know that he has a million adapters right so i thought oh he already has many ways to use a genesis pad but then in his video he tried to plug an atari 2600 joystick in and it didn't work it's not supposed to and he wrote me after he shot the video and said hey a surprising thing happened i couldn't get the 2600 joysticks or the Genesis joysticks to work with that. I was like, oh no, it's not supposed to. It wasn't designed to. The same circuit board can do both, but you got to jumper about five different wires differently for them to work versus this the for the Sega or the 7800. So that was the best beta test I could ask for, right? Because I saw in, in real life, someone who's very knowledgeable didn't just assume that a 2600 would work. So that has helped enormously because when people order and they want the 7800 version, I make sure that they know, that, I make sure they've seen Steve's video and they know that it's not designed to work with anything but the 7800 adapters. However, I've been asking people, so, so this is, I'm curious, like, why do you want the 7800? I try, to, <laughs> I try to ask that gingerly. And so it's uh, opened my mind about what people use. There's lots of people who are heavily invested in either the Aladdin controller the super 78 some people have those little euro pads they love those um there's all kinds of controllers out there that i didn't realize that are not the one that i was just holding up right. there's another one called the bratwurst controller so this is really enlightening and now i'm not as against making both kinds <laughs> happy to happy to do it but matt why doesn't everyone just pick the sega one because the sega controller is 10 times better than any of them other ones i think so uh but you you really kind of I, I can see wanting to have multiple options. I kind of get it well, because I know I do understand that. But if yeah, you, if you've you invested in a, one of those Aladdin sticks and they're they're pretty expensive, right? Like I can see wanting to be able to use that on both your seventy eight hundred and your fifty two hundred. So I get it now. But I'm glad I finally get it, and it's not just people messing with my head. <laughs> so uh, Aladdin was make. I, I don't think they're making it anymore. It was called a seagull cv controller adapter and it allowed you to use 
Um, 2600, 7800, uh, Atari 8 bit computers, Commodore 64, classic ColecoVision, flashback ColecoVision, and Collector Vision Phoenix uh, controllers through this adapter. And in Steve's video, that's what finally saved the day. So he was going to review it. And then he told me ahead of time, hey, I'm going to review this on my channel. I was like, oh, no, no, you don't review it for my sake. Just I just wanted you to have it because I thought you could use one. Uh, I forgot what I was saying. So about the adapter. So oh yeah. So I said, uh, yeah, don't talk it down because I don't want to be suddenly inundated with orders. I sh you should focus on the bad things. <laughs> and when I told my wife about the video, she's like, well, he did focus on the bad things. That's just what you asked him to do. I was like, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I saw I saw that video. I'm like, I gotta have one of these, and there's no way <laughs> there's no way in hell I'm ordering the 7800 one. That was that was my takeaway from the video. I Man, I looked at the controllers. It was funny that night when I ordered when I sent you the emails. Looking at it, and I'm saying, do I really want one of the 7800 ones? I looked at the controllers. I go, no. Yeah, the controllers are one. just they're just bad. So I think most people will want the Sega version, but yeah, hey, whatever. But your, it was your own. I mean, it was that since I have a Sega controller, that would be. <laughs> The easiest for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I tell you what, you can play Pac-Man really, really well for the first time ever. I mean, that controller was so bad. I remember trying to play when I started collecting for it, trying to play Frogger. And oh, in Frogger, the controller they they tried to build in to the game to fix how bad the game, how bad the controllers were, where you push up and you hit the button to jump. Yeah. So when when they when people started releasing the ROMs. And started doing the ROMs and doing emulation. Somebody went in and removed that button press so you could actually play the game without having to hit a button. Because imagine, you know, Frogger is one of those games where the timing has to be perfect. And if you have to think about pushing up and hitting a button, pushing let, hitting a button, think about the playability on that game. And that was there were a lot of 5200 games that were that were that way. And not taking away that there were great games for the 5200. Well, the the twenty six hundred joystick. No matter what direction you push, you feel like you're not going. You're not pushing in that direction anyway because it hardly moves. <laughs> so, you know, and then you you end up hurting your hand because you're pushing so hard. So, but well, it ends up being that Aladdin Siegel adapter that saves the day. Because when Steve found that it didn't work with the twenty six hundred or the Sega Pad, he you know that man has so many adapters. He's going to make it. Work. Oh yeah. He whipped out the Siegel adapter and it's like, ah, now it works with just about everything. Now, the one thing you may have noticed is that he, in I thought the video was fascinating. Actually, I've watched it like three times. <laughs> he couldn't get the, um, the, the, the best, the one called the best controller. He couldn't get that to work. And I never quite understood why. So most people who have ordered that, I've told them, hey, I don't know why it didn't work with Steve's the best because I have one of those. But I have the telegames version. So I don't know if the best version is different. So I've I've asked everyone to test them with every 7,800. So I've kind of been asking people to hold off on ordering those just until I hear back from everyone. So the ones that are out in the field now, I sent about two or three out last week with someone who's got the Aladdin, someone who's got the Europad. But I assured them that I tested them all with the best controller and they should work, including Steve. So that's still a mystery I, I'd like to solve. That's um, weird. I never even knew about the best controller until I watched uh, Steve's video. I mean, I, I've ordered a lot of stuff from Bradley out on, on um, you know, Best Electronics. That's an experience, too. <laughs> it's, it's the best, but it's still a 7800 controller, and it still hurts your hands. I'll tell you what, though. His his repair stuff for the 5200 com controllers, is it truly is the best. I mean, if you have a broken 5200, but you're going to pay money for it, Oh, that, that that just looks cool, but it still looks like it's going to hurt your hands. Like you know what? It is does the, hurt your is hands. That the best. And honestly, this one's a little better than the best. This is the Telegames version. Oh, okay. Is, <laughs> these are actually still available. This is news that nobody seems to know. I bought this new from Old Stock from the UK in October of 2020. When Steve, oh, did we get cut off? No, we're good. Steve asked me about it and I was like, hey, you know, I just got those. They might still be available. And I found the link in my chat with someone and I sent it to him and they're still available. 
Really? Uh, amazing. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily recommend them because like I said, there's still 7,800 controllers. Mine had mildew all over this. So I was like, this has been in a warehouse for a long time, but it cleaned up nicely. They didn't charge you for the mildew, right? They didn't, no. But I test all the 7,800 controllers with this and they work. So there's something different about the ones that best ships out. I'm guessing. I could be wrong. Well, Matt, you know, let me let me ask the big question. What does your redemption board cost? What I sell them for? Yeah. Oh, I sell them for $60. Okay. I was just wondering. I, I didn't know the price. Yeah. I sell them for $60 plus shipping. And, yeah, uh, and people seem to uh, be paying that. And they, no, it's, it's, I, it's, I, worth, it's worth it just for No, that's pack. definitely worth it. Yeah. 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 I tried to keep the cost down. In fact, I read on a Usenet post that the originals were $50. That might have been $50 with shipping. I'm not sure. So my original goal was to make them available for $50, just to be like, super double retro. So my my thinking here, so I didn't really answer this in the beginning. You asked, why did you come out with the, the Redemption Adapter? One thing I noticed is I started making them in t last year. Uh, if you think about the when the Atari 5200 came out, Technically, it came out in 1982, right? It came out in November, right before the Christmas season. But I think of that as a 1983 console. And the Redemption Adapters came out in 2003, 20 years after. It was like the 20-year anniversary. We're going to redeem this console with the Redemption Adapter. And when I was building these last year, I realized, oh, next year is 2023. It's going to be another 20 years. Let's celebrate the 20-year anniversary of the Redemption Adapter with the Redemption Adapter reissue for 2023. So I designed those labels last year, but I still put 2023 on the on the label there. So you can see that it says, well, you can't yeah. see from where you're sitting, but it says uh, 2023 reissue on it because that was my plan all along. So I had sent Steve his and to a couple friends locally in last year. But now since he put that video out, it sort of forced me to actually do it. That is funny, yeah, because they came out the ColecoVision came out about the same time. Coleco, I think, was July mm -hmm. or August of uh, 83. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's double retro. Double it's, retro. Yeah, it's it's the 20 year anniversary of, of, the, re, of the redeeming of the 20 year old console. Amazing. Speaking of 20 year old consoles, when did the when did the Vetrix actually come out? I know you're a Vetrix guy as well. Yeah, that was 1983 as well. Was it? That, was, that was kind of a golden year, wasn't it? So I, I think was, so. Go, go ahead. Somebody that was um, um, what were you saying? Somebody was somebody jumped in, I thought. I thought I heard some too. <laughs> I don't no, know I what said, that was. I said I think it is, you know. Oh. <laughs> That's all I said. Yeah. No, it was um I remember seeing the Vetrix in the stores. It was, but I was putting all my money behind uh, behind Coleco cartridges at the time. So you work at McDonald's across the street, go to the mom and pop, buy a couple of games. You know, and games were what thirty bucks each at that point. I, it was a 30, 40, something like that. I forget what how much a Coleco cartridge was in eighty two, eighty three. I think there were some bucks. Like 30 bucks for the good ones, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only one that was more expensive was Zaxxon. I think Zaxxon came out more expensive. That's a Sega game. Well, That's I think cool. it was because the cartridge was bigger in that one because of what they had to put into it. I mean, because of the graphics. It was it's a bigger it was a bigger ROM than the typical what, what Donkey Kong was. You know, Coleco was a, one of those companies that was very cost saving. Everything was built cheaply. That's why some of those consoles aren't lasting. You know, they are, but not as much as like a, the, the 2600. You can't kill them. I mean, they the, most of those, they're still working, you know, with as many as they made. So you did a pen for the, the Vetrix. I, I didn't even know you could have a pen on the Vetrix. I think the Vectrex holds the distinction of being the first video game system with a light pen. So yeah, there were some drawing programs available for it. There was even a game called Mail Plane that you controlled with the light pen. If I'm there's there's also an animation program called Animaction, a couple other games, but total maybe four or five games used the light pen. It's not essential. It's just a nice to have. 
so it was it did come out and now this is this is new to me so the blade pen was an original thing mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. and of course because they didn't sell they're very expensive on the collector's markets which is why i why i started building them myself again with boards that i etched at, in my garage but sean kelly uh he's kind of the vectrex god uh everyone in the vectrex community knows his name because he was the first to come out with the multi-cart um and he has a beautiful reproduction light pen. And so that is what I recommend pe people buy now. But at the time, that wasn't yet available. And the, the only option I knew of was to build them yourself. So I've built quite a few of them. Awesome. awesome. Are, are there people that are ma uh, making overlays for the Vect Vectrex? There are, yeah. You should join uh, Vectrex Fans Unite. You'll get hooked. The only I disappointing thing about it is that they're so expensive now. What's, that's yeah. what I was going to say. I wouldn't be able to afford the system. <laughs> I see them everywhere we go. We go to all these different conventions, and I see them like four or five sitting on tables, and they're five hundred dollars plus. And I'm like, you got you, you, please. Oh, really? That's just yes. that's just for the overlays. The <laughs> system's like a thousand. No, no, no. I'm talking about the system. <laughs> no. John, you're hilarious. No, hey, John, you remember that? I forget which show we went to and. There was a whole table. It was all Vectrex, and he had overlays, and he had. He systems. did. He did. That was um, um, Torgs, I think. Yeah. Uh, in Columbus, but um, Columbus. I want I want one so bad. Uh, yeah. You know that's it's I have a I have a hole missing in my collection, but I play the games too. But um, you know it's it's saved for the Vectrex, but I can't I can't justify pot. They got to come down about two fifty. <laughs> right. <laughs> those. but I mean. I, I, I always hear this weird theory that people say that oh you'll like a sys you'll like the systems more that you owned when you were a kid. Some of them don't hold up. Well, I never had a Vectrex as a kid, it and it alive. immediately became my favorite system. I became obsessed with it, and it's the one I still kind of put as my favorite console. I don't know if it's my all time favorite. If I had to have only one, it might be the Vectrex because Mindstorm is so good. The the pack game game is good, and now the homebrew scene has just gone crazy it's... with great games. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Matt, what was the name of that group again? Vectrex. Vectrex Fans Unite, I think. Yeah. Hey. Hope is I got that right. Is that Facebook? It's a Facebook yes. group, yeah. Okay. Fans. Oh, I'm already a member. <laughs> that, was, that was wishful thinking that you had. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's two groups. One has 582 so, members and one has 5.8K. <laughs> yeah, you can tell uh, which hey, one. Yeah. Hey, Matt, what would, be a, what would be a fair price for one now that, with, that's working? Well, I'm shocked to hear the number 500. I wouldn't have guessed that. You know, it wasn't that long ago. I got all mine in the mid 2010s or the 2000, 2000. Yeah. But I never paid more than $70 for any of mine working. Oh my either. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, even just I, looking at eBay, and obviously you can't use eBay as, as the proof, but I mean, there's not a single one on here that's under $599. Here, there's a thousand, eighteen hundreds, um, seventeen hundred. You're gonna pay seventy dollars just for shipping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All of mine arrived from eBay at under $70, around $70 is what wow, I paid on that... average. I got one locally non-working for $40 that was just had a broken power switch. <laughs> so well, I that, just more... goes to, that just goes to show you how the, the, the retro collecting thing has exploded. You know, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I felt like I was hogging them because at one point I had four just, just as a backup, you know? Oh, so that's why they're over $500. <laughs> <laughs> and I used mine to help people locally get theirs working. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that I know how to repair them. Well, I have this reputation for knowing how to repair them, but really I kept those as parts. So sometimes if someone's logic board didn't work, if I diagnosed their logic board didn't work, but their power board did work, that's the vertical one. I just take the logic board out of that $40 one and I give it to my friend just to be nice. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people just didn't keep the Vectrex. So I didn't go crazy because I realized not everyone is going to bond with that system the same way I did. In our local arcade collecting group, it got popular maybe five years ago. And I saw at least six people acquire. And of those six, four people, they just didn't bond with the system for whatever reason. I thought everyone was going to love it as much as I did. So I was making homemade multi-carts for people and, and light pens and everything. So I don't, I don't repair them now just because 
I, 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 I was very naive about thinking everyone was going to love it as much as I did. So, well, you know, your experience might be different than mine, but I would hate to pay $500 just to find out, oh, I don't really like this system. I mean, well, man, are you selling the pens too, the, the light pens, or are you just making them for yourself? Uh, no, well, I don't really make them anymore. I mean, I could. I have the parts to make a few. If you guys, if you guys ever get yourself a Vectrex and you need one and you don't want to pay whatever the the night for the price for the nice one, even though that's what I recommend, you can probably afford it. They're not they're not outrageous, like expensive or anything, and they're very nice. But yes, can I probably we, have the parts in this room to to build a couple. Can we pick our own color of the uh, pen? As long as it's uh, pink, orange, or black. <laughs> Uh, yeah so yeah no that I, I it's crazy how much they are one of my guys at the at, at my office just sold his vetrex um and if i would have known he would have had it i would have done a trade and he was he, he sold it for like 800 wow. but he had the box and overlays uh that's painful which which and, and again i would have he goes wait a minute you have you have an extra atom you have this to, yeah dude i just would have traded you i said dude why didn't you ask? <laughs> so it's it's funny because when I do office calls, I actually have the ColecoVision stuff behind me. So wasn't this hobby way more fun when you could get a console working for 50 bucks? Yeah, Most of the consoles yeah. I bought, I got them for under 50 bucks. If I think about the Genesis, the Super NES. That was about five years ago. I mean, seriously, I started in 2018 it collecting is, again. As soon as it's like 2019 happened pre-pandemic it started to go up but as soon as everyone started going back out after the pandemic even just game conventions like when we went to game game conventions and stuff before they were there were people there but they weren't like packed to the gills now when you go you like if you're not there early and you have vip tickets everything's gone because people come buy everything to resell like yeah it's, it's the community it's all every i think i hate you know and this isn't i'm not trashing on anyone in particular but everything is way overpriced and i understand why the prices are up because the demand is up and the supply is down i understand economics um but it's ridiculous some of these things and, and the vectrix is one of the most expensive and i <sighs> i try to pay attention it's one of the most expensive um some of the atari computers are really high up there as well mm. um some of the old IB, ibms are real high but <sighs> it's weird those ibms were worthless just like five years ago yeah. <laughs> yep oh you could I, I mean i have a few of them that people were just giving away to yeah. get just at one point you could just pick them up from people because they didn't want them and now the other problem is that people post prices on ebay that aren't yeah what they sell for so people that don't know what they're what they have they go on there and they're like, oh, this is listed for a thousand dollars. I can get this for a thousand dollars. So um, I don't know. There's a lot of resellers too now. Like when you go to these conventions, it's not just like collectors and traders and stuff. Like it's people with legitimate businesses. Yeah. Like they're not a storefront, but they're like a traveling carny in a way. <laughs> and a lot of them are, <laughs> well, I mean that because like a lot of them are carny like at these conventions. They are they very much have a persona. And, uh, you know, they're over the top and, you know, video games, look at me, I do video games, I'm crazy, <laughs> kind of like stereotypical, you know, mid middle aged video game collector guy. That's what a lot of them are. Um, I like the last show we're at the guy that says, oh, this is my personal collection and everything was like double, triple the price <laughs> anywhere else. It was like, yeah, everyone's collection is personal, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm selling my friend's collection here. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, so, so I'm, I'm trying to experiment here, and I'll, I'll follow. So this is a little bit off topic. I'll follow back up with everyone though. I went on eBay to all the Vectra, a couple. I shouldn't say all. A couple of the Vectrex sells on here, and I added them to my wish list to see if anybody offers me lower <laughs> for them. Might as well. Yeah, that, that that sometimes does work. I've had it happen on some other things. That's actually how I got um one of my Atari computers, it was listed for 600. I sat there on a wish list for like four months and I got it. I ended up getting it for like 250 because the guy just gave up. <laughs> oh, it's making me wish I got an Atari. Atari 800 is on my, on my wish list. I wish I'd gotten one when they were cheap. <laughs> Should uh, we yeah, all just make bad. lists of what we want to get now and just hurry up and do it before the prices go even more through the roof? Is the same thing going to happen with Atari 5200s? Well, I, I think 
This has got to crash sooner or later. Well, the fifty two hundreds are getting destroyed because people aren't don't ship them correctly, and and a lot of people are, are, are commenting on that. Is the few that are surviving are are not making it to their destinations because people aren't you know they don't pack them. It's it's amazing. I had an atom somebody actually shipped me in a one of those plastic storage tubs with no packing around it. It <laughs> it got killed. The printer got killed, and uh, the guy. The guy was really apologetic. He paid, I, I don't even know how much he paid for shipping to, to, to send it back. But um, but it's it's amazing how how people are just flipping stuff that don't even know what they have just because of the pricing on eBay, mm -hmm. which is kind of a shame. I mean, again, you see these old systems, 40 years old, just absolutely destroyed because somebody didn't take 10 minutes to, to put bubble wrap around the corners and stuff. I mean, the one guy shipped, the, the, the 70 the, the 5200 media mail which my mailman actually said there was a you know he saw the hole in the side of the box and he said what was in there i said an atari 5200 he goes you know he can be fined for that mm -hmm. said, do you I want to that do it? it i'll give you the information you like, nah, I'll, I'll worry about it later but but yeah i mean it's that's the sadder thing i mean it's the vetrix because of the screen i would think people would have to pack them better because if that doesn't arrive you know, those screens, you can't even get that screen anymore, can you? Well, you'd be surprised how many Vectrexes are damaged in shipping. That's one of the, yeah. the most popular horror stories is someone, like, puts a bath towel around it and then sticks it in a box and expects <laughs> it to survive. So uh, I'm a, I'm an annoying when I buy anything is I always write to the seller, even though you know 95% of the time they know what they're doing. They're going to double box it. I always ask them, can you double box that, please? or can you just make sure there's enough bubble wrap? I always write to them because you never know if you're going to get one of those people who just takes the original box and sticks up a shipping label on the original box, which I'm sure you guys have seen as well. I saw someone on the Atari 800 or on a, the Atari group had an Atari 800 with the original box and the person used the original box as the ship. Uh, uh, he just duct taped a label right to the top. I mean, not duct tape, but package taped a label right yeah. to the top. Oh, so you really, I think it's worth taking the time to be annoying. I've had people say, I know what I'm doing. I, don't worry. Stop worrying. But I'm like, I got to worry because I don't, I don't want to be one of those stories like you just told. Even though I hope it's rare, you got to ask, I guess. Yeah, I got two 5200s in the same week. Both of them destroyed because of, <laughs> as a poor packing, which that's rare. I had hey, a Vetrix box. But, a I box saw that. Look at the bottom. Of, the bottom's missing an entire flap. Is it really? I didn't yeah. even go into it. They want one hundred and fifty dollars for it. It's missing a flap just for the box. I'm missing a flap on the bottom. Flap. My my worst nightmare uh, shipping incident was actually from a Goodwill auction online. Um, it was a I, I don't remember the model computer, but it was an old Macintosh um, when they were building the towers. Um, and literally, they just put some um, uh, newspaper in a box and put it inside of it and send it here. And like all the plastic on the bottom was busted. And, you know, I'm like thinking like, I get it's goodwill, but you guys should know better. <laughs> and cause you, especially with those older plastics, like that stuff gets brittle. Yep. And you bouncing that around in a truck. I see what these postal companies do when they put boxes in trucks, they toss them from the tops of buildings. Like they're playing basketball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta like put some shock absorber in there. You got to suspend it in the middle with like rubber so that it's just hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So actually, real, real funny. Um, before we before we lost um recording earlier, which did happen, and it's spliced together now. I was looking up that Tapper's Bar you were talking about in Indianapolis. Um, now I'm it's on my it's on my to go to list next time I'm around that area. <laughs> oh, do you ever get to Indianapolis? Yeah, I love Tapper's. They have great drinks. They have amazing pinballs. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. Amazing. Amazing um, game. I have just had something open up recently here. I live in Cleveland, um, mm -hmm. so not super far away. Somewhere in Ohio. Somewhere in Ohio. Yes. I get the reference. <laughs> somewhere in Ohio. I should have said that. I messed up. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna edit that so it just sounds like I say somewhere in Ohio. <laughs> somewhere in Ohio. <laughs> um, uh, but we have something similar to this here, pretty close to my house. But it's it's more of like it's like a dive bar that they put arcade machines in. This is like a bar that they built around arcade machines. Nice. Um, which is a lot nicer plus tappers is a cool name for an arcade bar it sure is yeah john, john just acquired tappers for um the ColecoVision. Not i too did long ago. yeah 
Congratulations. Tapper. Tapper. He's only got one. Yeah, Tapper. Yeah. Tapper. So. All right. Well, oh. What else? What are the questions do we have, guys? Um, um, I mean, we can always do real quick. We can do a, qu a couple of the uh, the speed round um, questions that we have. You know, that's a little off topic. It's just about gaming in general. Did we? We don't think we asked. You know, first game you remember playing? What got you into gaming? Um, favorite favorite retro game? Favorite uh, and current favorite game? Kind of style questions. There, I'll let you free free form those. <laughs> Are you guys answering these or are you asking me? Oh, no, we're asking you. I think we... <laughs> <laughs> I missed the episode. I, I want to hear more about what you guys are collecting so I can. Uh, oh, and I, I, I'll talk about when we're done here um, real quick. But yeah, so what what game got you into gaming here? Like first, oh, it's hard to first say. Game, first game you remember. First game I remember was a black and white game called Circus. Um, oh, yeah. We used to, you know, I remember seeing pinball machines as a young kid, but I was just fascinated. I was probably maybe eight or nine years old. And I, at the ice skating rink we went to often, uh, there was a, there was, there were black and white games, you know, the, the operators used to call them screen games because they were still in black and white next to the pinball machines. And I was fascinated by them. I've never seen anything like it. So I don't know. That was my first, like, seeing someone play. I, at the ice skating rink, they had Atari football, you know, where you have a trackball on each side and you're moving little X's and O's around. My my little eight-year-old brain was kind of boggled by that. So that was the first time I was aware that video games existed. Um, but no, I don't know that I had a game that got me into it. It's just uh, around 1980, some of my friends who could afford Ataris were getting them and it was playing Space Invaders on Atari at someone's house that got me obsessed with the idea that I wanted to afford an Atari. So I started saving my paper out money and that's what got me into gaming in the first place. Cool. cool. What's your favorite current game? Well, here's a here's a weird thing about me i've noticed that you guys are gamers most of you play modern games i don't really play modern games um i still like the old ones i'm really more into retro than i am into gaming so what, what's am, your favorite current homebrew retro game and right now i'm playing a lot of bosconian on the 5200 so i'll pick a game and then i'll play it for weeks and weeks and weeks and right now i will go i'll never get tired of playing bosconian i mean i eventually will but that's what i'm playing right now uh, games where you basically sh uh, shoot things and you avoid getting shot. So I never got into games with plot and inventory system and all that kind of stuff. So I have a very narrow window of what I enjoy playing. <laughs> sure, sure. So I guess we can't talk about Skyrim then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm, 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 I'm like you are. Elden I Ring. I don't want to have to think when I'm playing. I just want to. <laughs> I want to. I mean, if, if I'm solving a puzzle or something, and some game Luck. that's fun, but I don't want to look at inventory. And <laughs> you know, I remember the first time I played. Um, what was it? Um, um, you like Tiny Tina's Wonderland? It's literally half of the game is inventory that's, management. <laughs> that's the, the first time I played. I played that. Um, Borderlands. The yeah, first Borderlands. The half first that time game I played is inventory. It, I was management. still. Dude, I was still playing with level one guns <laughs> up until I was like level 20. And, and I joined some, some of my friends joined me and they said, Mike, which gun are you using? I'm like, I'm using this gun. They go, That's a level one gun. I go, I can change that. Yeah, here go in the inventory. Oh, I didn't want to have to do that. That's that's I just want to shoot stuff. Yeah. So, so that I was like the that. first time I ever that was the first time I ever learned it. And, and uh, again, it I just now I just go in, get the biggest gun I can, and then do that kind of stuff. So it still does translate. Like Elden Scroll, Elden Rings, I couldn't play that. Elden Scrolls. Elden Scrolls. Elden yeah. Scrolls. <laughs> Elden Ring. I couldn't play that. I mean, I'd, I'd play it more than JM would. <laughs> but, but I JM, play you should try out Elden Ring. Yeah, no, he's not going to play <laughs> no, that. No, I'm, I'm more like uh, Matt. I like the old school no. games. jm's more of like the puzzles in the newspaper kind of guy the crosswords <laughs> no no i'm not like that at all no. he's doing the donkey kong man hey uh, <laughs> good we're in good company and my, my friend mike veal used to work at GameStop, and he would make fun of people like us he was like jenkins you're the guy who, you're the kind of customer we used to hate the kind of customer who would be who would come into the store and say oh no i don't want a game where i have to read stuff they would make fun of guys like that well we're, we're i think i Three of us on this call might be those kind of guys. Well, you know, there's more out there than you think that are like us, my yeah. uh, Matt. 
my my daughter's a, a gamer. She loves. She has a PC just for gaming. She's always making fun of me in a, in a kind way. Uh, when she sees me playing Bosconi, and she's like, "You should play like something good." She's like, "Can you imagine? Like, is this a good game?" And I was like, "I love this game. This is great." She's like, "Can you imagine if you played a game that was actually good?" <laughs> <laughs> she knows, she loves cool. to razz me. Sure, <laughs> so, sure, night trap. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, I feel old here because everyone's you know, what's your favorite first game? Mine was Pong. Woo woo! Yeah. I mean, as I, we had a pong. That was the first video system I had. So, first game you mean like a, one of those home pongs? Yeah, the one with the two knobs. Me and my yeah. brother. Yeah, yeah. we had one of those too. All right, back and forth. I had the Magnavox one. I couldn't afford that's, the Atari one. That's the one I think we had. I think it was a Magnavox. I had the Magnavox one. And then There's my friend got the Atari, and then I got the Odyssey. You know, the Odyssey two. So. Oh wow! First. Yeah, no, you're right, MM. That's what we had too. Uh, yeah, but- after the they came out with pong on a, on a chip and all the the uh, no name knockoffs started coming out that was when they got cheap enough that my dad brought one of those home so that was actually my first actual video game experience i stand corrected yeah it was for us it was that one and then my parents wanted to get a 2600 and i kept begging them not to i said you, you begged them not to i begged them not to because it was eight it was late 81 or early 82 and i'm like something else is coming because i was looking at because i was a pc gamer apple II gamer at the time so i was getting the, the magazines talking about electronic gaming and it started talking about this system from coleco that was coming out and i'm like this thing's gonna blow the graphics away on this thing and you know but we want pac-man that looks like crap i mean you know we don't want that we want to wait it, you know there's this game coming up we played it in the arcades it's called donkey Kong. So I had to take my my family the next time we were in the mall into a place and show them what Donkey Kong was to stop the Atari purchase to 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 save up and do the Coleco purchase. It was it was you know that's the reason I did get a twenty six hundred. Best packing game ever. Brilliant oh, yeah. brilliant move on Coleco's part. Yep. The story behind it's really cool if you ever no, go and read that. it. But it's super, a really cool story. Mario sixty four came with a Nintendo sixty four. It's a hard hard competition there to say yeah but how many years later was that because you remember <laughs> was born. let's let's think about this a little bit. Uh, i wasn't uh, alive uh, yet <laughs> hey, let's think about this a little bit uh, combat blackjack poker for the intellivision donkey kong let's yeah. let's look at the comparison at the time you know and hey mike and it looked good too <laughs> and it looked like it it looked like it yeah so, we so have, if, I, if I want to buy a ColecoVision now, tell me the bad news. How much? I know that I looked a few years ago and they were still on eBay for 50 bucks untested, which probably means mm. not working. What, what do they run these days? Close to 100. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 100, 100. I, Probably between eighty and 110, right, Mike? I got, I got mine for 70 off eBay with That's free I mean. shipping. Okay. I got yeah, mine I got, in the box for 150 in 2019 when i swore i wasn't going to collect ColecoVision games again but for about that you can get one um the thing with ColecoVisions is if they say non-working today i'm more suspect than if they said non-working a couple of years ago a couple of years ago you could buy it as non-working you shoot some deep deep you know the deox in, in the in the uh switch and nine times out of ten that right there is probably going to solve it just take it apart um, and, and if you had to take the switch apart, take it apart, or it's really easy to replace it. Today, most of these ColecoVisions, the ones that are that are out there, they're they're ones people have, have worked on and failed on, and mm-hmm. um, and and that's the biggest risk is that RAM that's inside of there, the, the negative five, positive five, twelve volt RAM that's in there. Y- y- you can replace it with a newer version, but that newer version, because of the supply chain issues. You can't, they can't get it right now. So if you get a broken ColecoVision, unless somebody already has stock in the, in the RAM, you're stuck with a broken ColecoVision for a little while. So that's my only concern about buying one today. I mean, the RAM didn't always fail. It wasn't the biggest issue with a ColecoVision was the switch. So if somebody is showing you that they're saying, well, it works, but you have to kind of wiggle the switch. That's a good sign. It's just the switch. Uh-huh. So, so if you if you see some an auction that says that and it's like seventy bucks or something, it's worth that. The cartridges for the games that you 
everybody knows Donkey Kong, Smurf, Ladybug, the, the, the common ones, they're going anywhere between three and five. That hasn't gone up. The ones that have gone up are the ones that, that are like Mr. Deuce Castle. Um, the, the ones that are a little, that, that weren't, the, you know, the ones that were the launch titles. The launch titles are very easy to get for ColecoVision. And there's about 20 of those real easy to get cartridges. But anything beyond that 20 of the 169, I think is how many came out for the ColecoVision in its lifetime. Anything after those 20, you're going to pay a little bit for. Um, I mean, Wizard of Id math right now is it's like <laughs> two, 216. Um, you look at, I was Don't trying do to find it. Yeah, Don't I'm, do it. yeah, I'm not doing it. I mean, the Dance <laughs> Factory, the Fisher Price game is like 100 bucks right now. Or maybe you should do it before they go th even higher through the roof. Does everyone on this call have a ColecoVision? Am I I'm the only one out of the loop yes. here? <laughs> yeah, you're the only one in the loop. All right, the I loop. don't belong. I'm the newest. I'm the newest one to it. Yeah, he's the newest one. And, Your pressure, uh, right? M M M and myself, we have the Phoenix, which yes. is a uh, made okay. by a company in what? Uh, I'm familiar. Montreal. With it. Yeah. Montreal, yeah, and Matt, um, Matt, Matt actually says he follows Collector Vision. So, oh, do you? Okay, yeah. I'm on their mailing list, even though I don't have a Coleco. And we're, do you all have the multi card for it? Yeah, I, well, I do. I, mean, I think just, just Jam and I do. J JC, you don't have, you don't have a um, Atari Max, do you? I do not. No. Okay. No. Okay. So yeah, I've, I've got two of them for that system. Not for Coleco. I have it for other systems, but yeah. It's it's absolutely yeah. worth it. I mean, it's it it, oh, it yeah, does definitely. work on it does work in the atom too. Yep. Yeah, which I do. I have an atom as well, which I think just you and me, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got. I still have three. I still have two standalones and one, one of the ones with you put the the atom in the ColecoVision. Put the atom onto the ColecoVision, which but, is. But the, the games for the ColecoVision continue to like improve. I mean, there, they, there are several. I think I honestly think there's more third-party developers right now for ColecoVision than there is for the other systems. I mean, even I'm, Tari, I'm, even they, Atari. Yeah, I'm I'm impressed though. I've I've gotten more into the Intellivision homebrew scene, and there's a lot going on. That's oh, yeah. Like, that's like really push it that pushes the the hardware on the yeah. Intellivision. Um, yes, some of the newer titles, John, have they they've really been been impressive. I mean, what was the first one I ever found was, um, oh, I can't think of the name off the top of my head. It was Castlevania that was ported to the, Intellivania. Um, yeah. They ported Castlevania to Intellivision. Yeah, that, that was impressive. a good one. And now I've seen, they've, they've not just ported, but they've made Intellivision versions of other games that came out much later, um, whether it be on like the Master System or the, or the Nintendo. Um, so I'm, that's what I'm into right now. The um, I thought somebody had even tried to do a Super Mario Brothers on the in television. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't. It's not finished yet. I think I just posted an update, and well, it would have been between us, um, in our Discord. But um, I, there was an update like a month ago about the status of it, and I think they were thinking about changing the name. Obviously, yeah, imagine that. For, Cause, well, cause yeah, the well, one got shut down. You know, you know, oh, it's not too long before the news gets out, and then all of a sudden there's Nintendo cease and desist flooding your mailbox. So um, it's just the uh, just the, the nature of it. But speaking of cease and desist, um, we have any final questions here for this interview? I, I just don't want to carry it on too long or anything. Sure. Um, but it's, it's great having you on, Matt. Um, yeah, thanks you know, so much. Would thanks. love to have you on again um, for you know talk further about what you're doing, what you like, um, you know, and. Uh, yeah. We always appreciate having people coming on and talk to us because we like to talk, we like to learn, and you know, we're the, we're the Tegaji nerds. And what do the nerds always like to say? Stay, Stay nerdy, nerdy, my, my friends. friends.